In 1922, about 50 miles north of Munich, in a small settlement called Kaifeck, the most mysterious and gruesome murders in German history would take place. At the homestead of Hinterkaifeck, the bodies of six people were discovered bludgeoned to death by a farm tool. They had been lying there for days without anyone realizing it. There was even evidence that their killer never left. There were stories from a previous maid, Kreisens Rager, who quit months prior, that told of strange sounds coming from the attic, footsteps and voices. The killer may have been living alongside the family inside the homestead for months. In this video, I want to talk about Hinterkaifeck and all of the details leading up to the murders. I want to go over the timeline of strange things that happened to the family before March 31st, and then what happened to the farm in the aftermath. Together, perhaps we can unlock some of the mystery of Hinterkaifeck. Maybe we can even make some educated guesses as to who could have possibly committed these heinous crimes a century ago. The Gruber Gabriel family had long occupied the farm that was built in 1863. Andreas Gruber was 63 and took care of the property with his older wife, Kazelia, who was 72. Their daughter, 35-year-old Victoria, had purchased the farm with her husband, Carl Gabriel, after their marriage. Carl Gabriel would die in the First World War. Germany was a tumultuous place during this time. There was political turmoil as well as national grief. Nearly two million German men would lose their lives in World War I, and more than four million would come home wounded. The Deutschmark was losing its value fast. People were losing their livelihoods and were finding it hard to even afford their basic needs during this time. In nearby Munich, Adolf Hitler was beginning to rise in popularity as the Nazi party was slowly forming in the city. All of the commotion in Munich, though, seemed like a million miles away in this isolated hamlet. What happened here would overshadow even the madness in Munich for a short time. Even before Carl Gabriel left for war, he was not happy in his marriage with Victoria, and he was vocal about his disgust for Andreas. He was a very mean man, and often refused his family food and treated them abusively. Before Carl went off to war, he left Hinterkaifeck to return to his parents' home. He was tired of the treatment, but something else had made him want to go home. There was new information that had come to light, and it was the final straw for him. There were rumors about Andreas and Victoria, but Carl would see it firsthand. Andreas was having a sexual relationship with Victoria, and Victoria did not want to stop. Carl left the farm and returned home to his parents' house a short time before he went off to war. He couldn't stand to be on that farm a moment longer. Carl Gabriel would tragically lose his life in the trenches in France, and his body was never able to be returned home, like many soldiers during that time. But this would cause some rumors to swirl about his potential involvement in the Hinterkaifeck murders, some thought even from beyond the grave. Victoria had become pregnant before Carl went off to war, but he would not meet his only child. Now seven-year-old Kazelia Gabriel, referred to as Silly, lived at Hinterkaifeck with her mother and her two-year-old brother, Yosef. The paternity of Yosef was not entirely clear. Victoria was a beautiful woman who was very forward when it came to what she wanted. She held the affections of more than one man, though her father would hardly ever allow those relationships to blossom. He was a controlling and abusive old man. There were rumors all over the village about Andreas actually being the boy's real father. 
Lauren Schlittenbauer would claim to be the father of the boy for a short while. He later said that Victoria begged him to claim paternity of the boy and even offered him the money to pay for child support every month if he would go along with it. Even with Victoria's request, Lorenz did actually claim that Yosef was his biological child. His name would be on the birth certificate and he would talk about him in interviews as if it was indeed his own son. Years before the murders, Lorenz wanted to marry Victoria, but Andreas refused to allow it. Andreas reportedly locked her in a wardrobe when she asked. Lorenz eventually moved on. He would marry Anna Schlittenbauer. They would have children of their own together. Unfortunately, they would lose a child themselves only days before the Kaifek murders happened. If we carefully look at what happened before the murders, there were signs that something was wrong months before the attacks would take place. Had the family taken these strange occurrences more seriously, perhaps this tragedy could have been avoided altogether. One of the first signs that something was wrong was when former maid Crescent Rager began feeling uneasy in the house and claiming to hear footsteps in the attic. She had already been having a very uneasy stay with the Gruber Gabriel family. Not only had she caught Andreas and Victoria literally rolling in the hay, but she also was getting an unwanted visitor at her window at night. In the middle of the night, a man named Joseph Thaler came to her window to talk to her. He would do this for several nights. He asked if she wanted to be friends. She was not particularly interested. She could hear rustling next to the man, but could not see anyone else. He asked if he could come inside, and she said no. He continued to talk to her. He asked if she knew where old man Gruber and Frau Gabriel slept. She told him no. But he proceeded to tell her exactly where they slept in the house, and where little Yosef slept as well. He even told Rager that he knew where the family kept a lot of the money in the house. He knew they would move it under their bed at night. He knew a startling amount of information about the family. Thaler was really starting to scare her. He wanted to come inside, and he told her that he would come in one way or another. She could still hear leaves rustling next to him. But when she asked him what that noise was, he denied there was a noise at all and told her she was dreaming. When he finally left, she got up and went to the kitchen to see if she could find out exactly where he was headed. She watched through the kitchen window as he met up with another man outside. This man was slightly shorter and most likely his brother. They would look back at the house one more time before heading back into the night. One night was particularly unsettling when a man knocked on her bedroom window around midnight. This man would claim to be a farmer from nearby but she knew the person they were claiming to be, and they were definitely not who they said they were. The man wanted to come inside. She was not sure who he was, but she thought it might be Yosef Thaler's brother. He would leave, but not without making Rieger feel so uneasy that she knew she had to quit soon. On top of the paranormal activity she was experiencing in the house, she no longer felt safe at all. She felt like these men could kill her. In the days leading up to the attack, there was an intense winter storm that blanketed the region in a layer of thick white powder. It was bitingly cold, so the family stayed warm inside the home all night. When Andreas headed outside the next day, he noticed that there were fresh footprints in the snow leading into the motor hut from behind his house. There were none leading back into the forest. There are some witnesses who say they saw the footprints on different parts of the farm, and some even say they saw the footprints of two people leading into the property. It seemed that whoever made these footprints had gotten inside without anyone realizing it the night before. This really frightened Andreas, 
and this put him on high alert. The family lived in a heavily forested area of the community. Their farm was not far away from the woods that the locals referred to as Hexen Halls, or the Witch's Woods. Legends were abundant about the area. Andreas would tell several of his neighbors in town that day. Perhaps because of his past with the law, he was hesitant to seek any help from them. One day, a copy of a Munich newspaper would be discovered near the edge of the forest in the courtyard. The family had never been to Munich, and none of their neighbors subscribed to this particular newspaper. This was reported by the postman who was asked by the family if he knew where it came from. In March 1922, I was asked repeatedly by both Gruber and Frau Gabriel whether I had seen anyone, because they believed that someone was always in their property. Either Gruber himself or Frau Gabriel found a copy of the Munich newspaper. They asked me whether I'd lost it, or who in the area was the subscriber to the paper. Pastor Haas from the family church told investigators that the family had done something very strange two weeks before the murders. Someone had left 700 German marks in gold inside the confessional one day. The pastor knew who had this kind of money among his parishioners, so he asked Victoria about it, because he knew that the Gruber-Gabriel family were just about the only family in the financial situation to donate such a large sum. Victoria would confess that it was indeed her who left the money. She said she wanted to donate it to the church for missionary purposes, but this was not the safest way to leave the money with the church. People would go in and out of the confessional booth all day. Anyone could have taken that money. And someone repeatedly saw Victoria speaking intensely with a stranger in a graveyard in Vadehofen. She even reportedly slapped this stranger in the face. There were strange noises coming from the attic for months. Victoria had told people while shopping in town that she'd been hearing noises in the attic that she couldn't explain. Andreas said he was not afraid, though because he was ready to shoot anyone who may be in their home. He would also go up and check the attic regularly, shining a light everywhere, and would find no one there. A set of keys to the farm would go missing. Lorenz Schlittenbauer would testify that there was one key to the property. The only other time the key is mentioned is when Lorenz himself produces a key to the property that no one knew he had to unlock the doors to check on the family. This is a conversation that took place regarding the missing key between Old Man Gruber and Lawrence. I'll send you my old drum revolver, Lawrence suggests to Old Gruber. But he waves it away. Or even better, you call the police over there. They should send someone. They'll search everything carefully. Gruber interrupted the neighbors indifferently. No, no. That is out of the question. I don't want any police in my house. I can manage without them. I know how to defend myself. By the way, Andreas Gruber turned around after a few steps. Did you happen to find a key? It's about that long. He indicates the size with his hands. Lawrence shook his head. Why, was one stolen from you? Andreas looks over to the yard, then back to Schlittenbauer, but avoids looking him in the eye. The devil knows where our only house key is. I probably lost it. I haven't seen it since yesterday. On Thursday morning, March 30th, Andreas spoke to his neighbors about a break-in attempt at their motor hut. There were footprints leading in and traces of snow still inside, but none leading back out. This trespasser could not access the house from the motor hut, but the north door to the barn was right next to the hut. It appeared as if the lock to the hut had been tampered with. Inside the barn, someone could gain access to the house through the outer feed chamber. They could easily crawl up into the attic of the home from here or gain entry into the living area. Andreas felt violated and incredibly uneasy. He had told several neighbors about the footprints. The rest of his neighbors were on high alert as well. Something strange was clearly going on around Hinterkaifeck. Whoever got inside the barn did not steal anything, so what was it that they wanted? On the morning of March 31st, little Kazelia had fallen asleep in class. Her teacher asked her why she was so tired. The little girl told her that they were up all night searching for her grandmother. The old woman reportedly ran away after a bad argument. 
crying and talking about suicide. She would be found in the forest sitting on a tree stump. There were also reports that this was actually Victoria who ran away, though it is not entirely clear which is true. Perhaps she was afraid of something in the house. Perhaps Cazelia was confronting Andreas about what he was doing with Victoria. It is unclear why they ran away that night. There was reportedly a cow left untied near the stable leading into the barn the night before the murders. It was unclear if the cow had freed itself or if perhaps it was used to lure the family into the barn. Andreas told others about this in town the next morning. Investigators seem to believe that this incident with the loose cattle could have been a trial run for the murders. Could the sound of loose cattle be what lured the family into the barn? It was apparently a known tactic of a gang of robbers in the area. Andreas Gruber had reportedly stolen the mattock that belonged to Lauren Schlittenbauer. This would be the same mattock that was used to murder the entire family. Gruber stole the tool from the forest after they had finished working there together. Lorenz would often bury his tools so they could just get back to work the next day without having to carry the tools out every day. Lorenz claimed that Andreas would go back when he wasn't there and steal it. Although there were other witnesses who claimed that that mattock did indeed belong to Andreas Gruber. Sometime on the night of March 31st, the older family members would be lured into the barn. Everyone was wearing their pajamas except for Victoria and Cazelia. It seemed like they were getting ready for bed around the times of the murders. Andreas was attacked and suffered several blows to his head. His face appeared to be shredded from the attack. His wife Cazelia suffered several wounds to her head as well, and there were signs that she was strangled. Victoria Gabriel had several wounds on her head as well. There were signs that she was also strangled. Every attack seemed so personal, so filled with rage. It would take a lot of anger to do what this person did that night. They lured each family member into the barn, killed them, and then covered them with hay. Seven-year-old Cazelia was likely last and suffered a broken jaw and several head wounds. She was the only one who had her throat cut. They left her to die in there in the dark. Her family piled around her in the hay. Little Silly was said to have suffered in unimaginable agony for several hours in the barn before she finally succumbed to her injuries. She had clumps of her own hair in her hands, likely pulled out in distress. What happened to this little girl is perhaps the saddest part of the Hinterkaifeck story. The other victims were granted a relatively quick death, but she was not. Investigators say that she could have been potentially saved if the family had been discovered within the first couple of hours. The killer then snuck into the living area through the feed chamber and needlessly killed Maria Baumgarter and baby Yosef where they slept. It looked as if she may have gone to bed early she was the only adult who would be killed in her bedroom. If the killer wanted to exterminate the family for moral reasons, why kill Maria too? She hadn't heard or seen anything. She was sleeping on the other side of the house. Was it just to get rid of her? Investigators think that the adults were lured outside by a noise among the animals, but it was later discovered that it was likely that anyone who was in the main house could not really hear anything from the barn. It was too far away. What made Cazelia, Andreas, Victoria, and Silly go into the barn that night? Did they notice the loose cattle near the barn door? Did Andreas hear something and go to check it out? This killer was clearly not bothered by their crimes or afraid of being discovered. There is evidence that they stayed and helped themselves to the family's supplies. They would eat meals in their kitchen, feed the livestock, and milk the cows. The neighbors noticed that the chimney at the farm continued to smoke for days off and on in early April. They also noticed that the family dog, a yappy and cranky German spitz, would be tied up in the yard from time to time. 
Late on the night of April 1st, a neighbor said that he was walking by the homestead and noticed a glow coming from the farm's outdoor oven. He saw a large man tending to the oven, though he could not make out who it was, though he thought this person did fit the form of Loren Schlittenbauer. He remarked that the smoke smelled terrible, like burning rags. He said that he went to investigate further, but this person shined a light directly in their eyes without saying a word. This made the man so uneasy that he turned around and ran away. Was this the killer's motive? To steal the farm? Everyone knew the Gruber Gabriel family. They had to have known they couldn't stay for long. People relied on this farm for food and groceries. They wouldn't be able to hide away inside the farm forever. Whoever it was, though, had free reign of the farm for about four to five days. One of the first signs in the community that something was wrong was that Silly had not shown up for school. It was not entirely unordinary for her to be absent, but it was not really like her to miss school on a Saturday. Two coffee salesmen would come by the home and try to talk to the family about ordering coffee. However, they would find that Hinter Kaifek seemed oddly quiet. It was very unlike the place to not see children running around or Andreas and Kazilia working, but they left without seeing anyone. Michael Paul testified on April 5th that the farm seemed unusually quiet. Two hunters who routinely passed by the house noticed a strange silence across the place as well. They were going to stop by the farm for groceries but decided against it because no one seemed to be home. Two friends of Victoria had come by to pick her up for church on Sunday but no one would greet them outside. That Sunday, the entire family would miss Mass. This was unusual because Victoria was involved in the church choir, and they hardly ever missed Mass. This was when people started to really worry. The postman, who usually would see old Gruber and little Yosef in the kitchen during this time of day when he stopped by, saw no one. The farm was completely closed up. He did notice that the dog was tied up in the yard, though. An engine repairman had ridden his bike over to Hinter Kaifek in order to repair their engine. The engine they used at the time was an agricultural machine they used to cut large quantities of vegetables. The repairman knocked on the doors. No one answered. He whistled loudly, but even that does not bring anyone to the doors. He waited for some time in the courtyard before deciding to go ahead and start the repairs on the engine by himself. He repairs the engine and then leaves the farm. He informs several people that he did not see the family that day. Lorenz Schlittenbauer had been hearing the chat around the village about the strange silence over Hinterkaifeck. He decides to send his boys over to the house to check on the family. There is no reason that the entire family should be gone from the farm. Lorenz's two sons, Johan and Josef, went over to the house. The two boys looked around. They knocked on doors and windows, but there were no answers. Schlittenbauer was concerned when they came home and told them that there appeared to be no one at Hinterkaifeck. Lorenz knew something was very wrong. He gathered Michael Pohl and Jacob Sigil, and the three of them headed over to the house together. They would search the property and the outbuildings. They then forced their way into the barn. Lorin Schlittenbauer entered first. It was somewhat dark inside. They saw cattle untied in the stable, and the cows were looking at them through the door, and they all got an uneasy feeling. Lorenz tripped over something on the floor, but kept going. Michael told him to stop. He saw something. Michael noticed a foot beneath a pile of hay, and one by one, they discovered the bodies of Andreas, Kazilia, Victoria, and Silly. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. They were all stacked up on each other, and they would find their notoriously loud and vicious dog in the stable, and he had been badly beaten, but he would survive. While Michael and Jacob continued looking in the barn, Lawrence went inside the house, and he seemed very familiar with the layout. He wanted to go check on little Yosef, the boy that he thought was his son. Lawrence said that all he was thinking about 
was the boy must be hungry or in distress. The bodies had clearly been in there for a while, and baby Yosef could potentially still be alive. Many would remark about the familiar way Lorenz moved about the house. His ease at finding his way around would raise many eyebrows. Lorenz would unlock the front door from the inside with a key that no one knew he had, supposedly the only house key that existed. Schlittenbauer said that the key was actually left inside the front door. The truth about the key, though, is still unknown, and rumors quickly began that the killer was Schlittenbauer. Lawrence was acting very strange at the home that day, according to witnesses. Lawrence had been courting Victoria in the years previous to Yosef's birth. He had wanted to marry Victoria, but had been outright rejected by old Gruber, and this would cause a lot of tension between the families. Victoria was said to have been threatening to sue Lawrence for child support, even after their agreement earlier to help Andreas out of prison. But was Lawrence angry enough to do all of this? Andreas Gruber had a reputation for being a mean man. He was neglectful of his family and very abusive towards them. He regularly refused them food and would use his power over his family in several other abusive ways. Perhaps he angered the wrong person. Some people in the small village even began to believe that the darkness that was inside that house was so intense because of how evil Andreas was to his family. The family was known for being wealthy and for storing their wealth inside of their home. The family had about a 100,000 German marks in the home worth of gold silver, and other cash. Yet nothing of significant value was stolen. There were other burglaries that had taken place at other farms in the region. An 18 and 20-year-old were seen masked after beating a farmer and stealing their cash. However, the police never made the connection. On April 6th, a judge ordered that the entire estate be inventoried and sealed. On April 7th, 1922, Mayor Gregor declared that he would take over managing the property. Gregor informs the probate court in a letter on April 10th, 1922, that he is securing the estate by setting up a night watch. The night watches were reported to have been from 12 noon until 4 a.m. around the property. Over the years, the mayor would always keep three night watchers at the property to keep Hinterkaifeck secure. One said, we stayed mainly in the bakery during the night. We made a fire in the oven to warm up. I would like to mention that the wood that we burned was already put in the oven. The wood was probably put in by the owners of Hinterkaifeck. Our night watch lasted until dawn. During the night, we went through the courtyard every now and then, but we did not enter the premises. Investigators would try everything they could to find answers and resources were limited during this time, including having all of the victims' heads removed and shipped to another country for psychic analysis. They thought that perhaps a medium could speak to the family and find answers. There was no luck, however, with this method of investigation. Unfortunately, in the chaos of World War II, all six of the heads were lost. The family would all have to be laid to rest without their heads. During the initial police investigation, they believed it had to have been vagrants who committed the crimes. It made sense that someone who was perhaps wandering through the area had noticed the homestead and taken an interest in the farm and the family. The most interesting theory, though, is that the family could have been murdered because of their involvement with the early Nazi party or other far-right organizations during this time. Their property was isolated and quiet, so it was ideal for storing weapons or munitions. Political murders were very common during this time. Many people were killed for what they deemed treasonous acts against the far right. Perhaps Andreas had betrayed someone that he was working with. He was said to have agreed with the Nazis' political agenda. His moral compass was already skewed. It is not unreasonable to think that he would get involved with these kinds of people. When you consider the slaughter and suffering during the interwar years and then World War II, this theory to me holds more water than others. 
Germany was a terrifying place during this time. Even in a quiet place like Kaifeck, the Nazis would mindlessly kill millions of families, and perhaps they may have started with one family in rural Bavaria. One of the strangest theories out there is that Carl Gabriel, Victoria's husband who died in France during World War I, was not actually dead. It had been eight years after the war, but could it be possible that Carl was elsewhere in Europe during this time? Did he finally make it back home? Could Carl have been angered to come back home after all those years and find Victoria with another man's child, potentially her own father's? The story goes that Carl murdered the entire family and then fled to Russia. However, there's no real evidence for this. The police interviewed over a hundred suspects since 1922. The one suspect that was looked at the most was Lauren Schlittenbauer. He was the nearby neighbor and he was in love with Victoria and Andreas outright refused to let her marry him. Anna Schlittenbauer, his wife, said that he was sleeping in the hay around the time of the murders because he was worried about thieves. Around this time, hay theft was a legitimate problem in these agricultural communities. Did Lawrence lie to his family and say he was guarding the hay, but he was really sneaking around inside of Hinterkaifeck? Victoria had reportedly complained that Lawrence had extorted the family for money on multiple occasions. Could it really have been Lawrence, who was stalking the family for all those months? If so, why live inside the home before and after? He had his own farm and family to care for. He also had severe asthma, so it would be difficult for him to carry out these murders by himself. Witnesses noted that he was busy at the crime scene, tidying up, feeding the animals, and taking home two sick piglets to his farm. When asked about his behavior, he just said that he only wanted to help. Some people do indeed react differently to trauma. When the former maid first heard about the murders, her mind immediately went back to the strange men who visited her window late at night, the Thaler brothers. They told her that they would get inside, and they told her they knew where everyone slept. Did the family have any other known enemies? Was it actually a complete stranger? that had been stalking them from within their home? And how long had it been that this person was living with them before they decided to kill them? In 1923, Hinterkaifeck would be demolished, and during the demolition, construction workers would discover the murder weapon and a false floor in the attic. They would also find a pocket knife that more than likely belonged to the person who committed the murders. One night, someone would find Lauren Schlittenbauer looking through the rubble of Hinterkaifeck. When asked what he was doing, he said he was looking for some tools that old Gruber had stolen from him. In 1926, there was a devastating fire at the Schlittenbauer farm. This destroyed many important things to the family, including the document that confirmed Victoria and Lawrence's financial agreement for the child support when it came to baby Yosef. In 1944, during World War II, there was an air raid on the town of Augsburg. The Augsburg Judicial Building was where the records were kept on the murders. Large parts of this city, including the Judicial Building, would be destroyed. Countless pieces of evidence for the Hinterkaifeck murders, as well as many other important cases in the region, would be lost forever. The last suspect to be interviewed regarding the case was back in the 1980s. In 2007, a German police academy chose the Hinterkaifeck murders to investigate as a thesis for their semester. The students would spend six months and countless hours poring over all of the available evidence, and they would release an in-depth report of some of their findings. All of the investigators seemed to agree on who it was who likely committed the murders. However, they declined to release this information publicly to save the suspect's descendants from public scrutiny. Many signs point to Lauren Schlittenbauer, perhaps the Thaler brothers, or maybe even a shadowy early Nazi organization. Today, Hinterkaifeck is a public area. 
There's a small shrine with the names of the victims near where the house once stood. There's also a trail leading into the woods. It's a beautiful, picturesque place. And it's hard to believe that something so awful happened there a century ago. And no one has ever paid for it. In the 1980s, there was a documentary film about the murders released in Germany. There was even a play created in 1991, and then another documentary released in 1991 about the murders. This mystery has captivated people across the country and the world for decades, and it will endure because we can never have all the answers, yet we still want to try and find them. That's all I have for you today. Thank you for listening to this episode. I really appreciate you taking this journey with me through the darkness that was Hinterkaifeck. And I hope you learned something new from this video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to help my channel. I really enjoy making these videos and would love your support in making more. Until next time, stay safe out there.